in a world where overspending, debt, and keeping up with the Joneses rules us all. Where the voices from the merchants, restaurants, and credit companies lord over the common man. Out of the darkness, like a beacon of hope, comes a new voice. A voice that's rich and creamy, like your favorite butter, and delicious, like cheeseburger pizza on your diet cheat day. It's The Stacking Benjamin Show. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's The Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and Joe's mom got a hold of my crazy holiday calendar, which means she's now reminding us that it's National Weed Pulling Day. Well, Joe OG and I are about to get put to work, but before we do, we figured we'd record this podcast. On today's show, we welcome from Sophia Financial, Stephanie McCullough. Also, in our headline segment, how about a new exchange-traded fund that's offering a steady 7% income stream? Sound good? We'll share how it works. Plus, throw out the Haven Lifeline to a lucky listener and more. And now, two guys who never pull their fair share of weeds, Joe and O-J-J-J-J-J-G. I'm great at delegation. Don't they have uh, that little machine that you just spray the juice on all the weeds and it just kills them? (laughs) Roundup. You're, yeah, like thirty seconds, and then and then it becomes the food additive that you never thought you had in all of your food. Well, see, what I do is I just spray it along the everything, and so I don't have to mow the grass either. Mom just really puts well. it right straight on our food at dinner, because that's where it's headed anyway. Hey, everybody, welcome to the Food Science for the Win podcast. I'm Joe Salci. Hi, I've heard Joe Money on Twitter, and across the card table from me, the OG. So is that why Monsanto got replaced in the? Uh, S&P the other day. <laughs> they got sprayed out. S&P took yeah. some Roundup and sprayed Monsanto out of the right. S&P 500. Wouldn't that be like the two magnets, though? Like when you try to put magnets together, wouldn't Monsanto and Roundup be like <laughs> repelling each other? Like there would be no <laughs> ability for it to actually Cody. Did you see the first thing that Bear's doing? By the way, Bear purchased Monsanto and that's why Monsanto is out and Twitter is in. But did you see the news that the first thing that Bear's going to do is get rid of the name Monsanto? Because so many people hate it so much. Like it has such a negative connotation for so many people. Bear's like, no. So, but but the bad news is, is the, now it's The new Bear. name is Ice Cream and Lollipops. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Unicorns and Rainbows. Kid Brought friendly. Unicorns and Rainbows. <laughs> We're going to call it Your Happy Place. Right. saw a meme on on uh, Facebook or Twitter the other day that uh, an enterprising individual should name a beer company responsibility and watch all the other beer companies market your beer company I for you. That. Drink responsibly. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes. Thanks for the free plug. Hey, uh, you know what people would do if they were responsible, their OG, they would take better care of their money by heading to magnifymoney.com. You know, the average person saves $450 when they head to magnifymoney.com by having a better checking account, a better savings account. Whatever the product is, it's a better use of your money to comparison shop, right? We comparison shop the price of jeans. We use honey. We talked about honey on Monday's show to comparison shop all the places out there. Why wouldn't I use Magnify Money when it comes to your financial stuff? So whether it's getting the most on your credit card reward points, consolidating so you can finally pay those things off and pay less money to the man, your checking account, your savings, business loan, consolidation, consolidating those student loans, whatever it might be, stackybenjamins.com forward slash Magnify Money for the win. We're also this week talking about The Stacker, which is our Stacking Benjamins community newsletter shows up almost once a week. 
in your give or take in your mailbox shows up once a week when we are it's beach actually, time. Yes, when we're in the basement, we talked last on the stacker about fees, talk about all kinds of different things. We're going to talk about our tour where we're coming to Detroit, Kansas City, and Orlando this fall to do a live version of the show. We're also coming to Philadelphia for a meetup. So when we come around the country, we talk about it first on the stacker. Head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash stacker so that you can get yours. It's always free. You can always unsubscribe whenever you want. Mom puts hers on the fridge. Uh, so she digs it and reads it thoroughly all the time. Stackybedjamins.com forward slash stacker. We got a great show today. We're going to talk about questions to ask a financial advisor. And uh, these are the things, OG, they get in pieces from you. But we thought we'd have our good friend Stephanie McCullough talk about and just go into it more thoroughly from uh, step one to, to step 100. Questions to ask financial advisor, things to watch out for from financial advisors. So if you're looking for professional help, this is a great show for you. And, you know, if you're doing it yourself, it's also a little mind into the thoughts of what other financial advisors think besides OG, which the things OG thinks about can sometimes be scary. So I don't, don't want to do that too much. They're always right, but it's, <laughs> it's definitely scary. We got some headlines first, though, guys. So let's get this party started. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show, our Stacking Benjamins Headlines. Our first headline comes to us from Investors Business Daily. This written by Lawrence Carroll. This is some clickbait right here, OG. New exchange-traded fund aims to provide a steady 7% annual distribution rate. Hello? What's wrong with that? I'm in. Sign uh, me up. The piece says there's 79 million baby booners in every day. Did I say baby booners? You were right. Baby booners, baby boomers. And every day, 10,000 of them retire. Up until now, the asset management business has been focused on accumulation because that met the demographic trend. But now that trend's a changing, and those people need to draw down and live off the assets they've spent their lives accumulating. A new exchange traded fund, Strategy Shares NASDAQ 7 Handle, it's 7 H A N D L index ETF ticker symbol HNDL, if you want to get in on this Ponzi scheme, presents his good self. I'm, I'm, I'm kidding, lawyers. That was a joke. It was a joke. Presents itself as a solution to this problem. This ETF says it's the first designed to pay its investors a consistent monthly distribution. That distribution should equal 7% of the fund's net asset value by the end of the year. Still, I hear nothing wrong, OG. Sounds good to me. Except the I only thing. I just want to hear how the hell you're going to do <laughs> it's the, that. It's the only thing. As somebody who was born at night, but not last night, I want to know exactly how does that work? Because I've never found this product before. And you'd think mm -hmm. as old as the stock market is, somebody, somebody would have come up with this. Somebody would have gotten up with this. Yeah. Yeah. But there's always a better way. Want me to continue? Yes, please. In an environment where interest rates are so low that people can't afford to live off the 1% or less they okay, receive so they're on. Not, so they're not doing it from interest rates. Got it. Savings okay. accounts or CDs or the 2 to 3% that U.S. Treasuries pay, a 7% okay, annual that's, that's payout that's looks very attractive. Right. Quote, as opposed to just owning a diversified portfolio, investors wouldn't have to go to the effort to sell part of their holdings to generate what they would get from the distributions. The distribution is not a dividend. So they're not okay. they're not doing it from interest and they're not doing it from dividends. Not from treasuries. It's not it's not technically a dividend. Okay. So where are we getting all this seven percent from? It's a consistent payout investors can rely on. All or part of the distribution may consist of a return of capital. Meaning a piece of this that I like is that there's often different ways to peel this onion, right? We can okay. pay out a dividend. We can have a return of capital. I like this idea of selling off capital gains if we're making capital appreciation. That's cool. But what do we know about capital appreciation? Mm, not uniform, but okay. Kind of, kind of inconsistent. What what happens? What happens if it doesn't generate enough dividends and capital gains to distribute seven percent? And that's the very next sentence. That means huh. if dividends, fixed income and capital gains don't fund the distribution, it may be funded by the capital investors pay in. Hold, hold on. Slow blink, slow blink, slow blink. <laughs> Which part do you want to get, OG? Do you want the smoke or the mirrors? I'm just wondering, like, when this guy goes to court and the prosecutor says, quote, 
<laughs> We're going to use other people's money to pay Jack back his. Quote, I think it's a unique and novel approach. No, it's not. No, there's- no they started this in like the 20s. Every, every generation, every decade, there's a guy that comes up with this new. In fact, the first guy's name was Charles. Is this his last name was Ponzi? Is it? Is this the first one that just tells you openly, "Hey, we're going to give you the other guy's money. If if we can't come up with it somewhere else, we're just going to give Don't you." Don't sweat it. We'll just we'll just use somebody else's. You're good. But as long what, as you're an early investor, that must mean then that your share value goes down in price, right? Yeah, yeah. They're liquidating the fund. So so the, the thing. There's a couple other layers to this, right? So he talks about that they're also going to employ leverage, right? So they're going to lever the fund by 30%. And what that means is, is they're going to borrow on the stocks that they own to buy more stocks to increase the yield. This is very sexy and sounding in theory until the market goes down. And then you get doubly (laughs) by this guy's ridiculously (laughs) stupid quote. We don't like to talk about the leverage part because it upsets people. Said Cohen. <laughs> but leverage can be your we friend. We read that on page 600 of the prospectus. Most people don't read that far. Take a low risk portfolio and leverage it up to the level of risk you're interested in taking. You have a better overall investment experience. Such funds can be useful, said Eric Balkanas, senior ETF analyst at Bloomberg Intelligence. Quote, I call them yield-seeking missiles. You just buy it and it goes out, gets yield, and makes your life easier. And a 7% yield is really juicy, he said. However, it's pretty expensive. Yeah. And there's another product that does something similar and plays close to the same yield. Handle charges a 0.95% expense ratio. First Trust Multi-Asset Diversified Income Index Fund holds 20% equities, 20% REITs, 20% preferreds. 20% 20% master limited partnerships, 20% high yield corporate debt doesn't guarantee its yield of about 6.7, but that charge is 0. 0.70 and uh, isn't guaranteeing it. <laughs> Just The other thing that's interesting too on this, of course, is that is the allocation. You skipped over that part, but, but the allocation of this fund is ostensibly 50-50, right, with some margin. And so already a 50-50 stock portfolio, stock bond mix is going to be you know, getting seven percent consistently is already going to be difficult. Yeah, I'm going to watch this one explode from afar. I think. Welcome to cynical news day on stacking Benjamins because check out our second headline here. OG, uh, this comes to us from CNBC. Bitcoin is not the quote panacea people thought it would be. Ripple CEO says. Oh, it's not as great. Oh, <laughs> Bitcoin's not going to solve all my problems. And it's another crypto dude saying, hey, this thing might not be everything you, th- Mine will. you thought it would be. Mine will. Yes. But Bitcoin. Yes. Not gonna. Bitcoin is not the, quote, panacea to solve the problem people thought it would be. Brad Garlinghouse, the CEO of blockchain startup Ripple, told CNBC in an interview that aired last Tuesday, Ripple is a San Francisco-based company that's developing a network for faster global payments. XRP is the digital token that financial institutions on the network can use to transact quickly. The currency and the company were founded by the same people. XRP is traded on cryptocurrency exchanges, and one is currently worth $0.65. Cents. Garlinghouse, who emphasized that Ripple is independent of the XRP token, said Bitcoin will have a role in the future, but not one that will see it solve major problems such as becoming a global currency. Quote, I think it's not going to be the panacea people once thought it would be, where it would solve all these different kinds of problems. Instead, you're seeing specializations of different kinds of ledgers, different kinds of blockchains, Garlinghouse told CNBC at the Money 2020 FinTech Conference in Amsterdam, Netherlands. He explained that the Bitcoin blockchain, the technology that underpins the cryptocurrency, is quite slow in quotes, whereas RXP transactions are, quote, a thousand times faster. So you're seeing this already in Bitcoin. And I do find this interesting, OG, because we know that we're probably headed toward the future here, but the future is full of potholes. And we're seeing that the speed of transactions matters. And also to uh, Mr. Garlinghouse's point, you're seeing different types of crypto being used by different industries to transact deals and the road is getting more fragmented versus becoming one blockchain for all. I don't think right now we're going to see anytime soon one blockchain for everybody. Well, as far as the uh, information I have, which is super limited in this space, I think that the technology of faster payment processing and you know some of the other things that we've talked about around like home ownership and like documenting you know, this piece of land and like areas that don't have that ability, right? Like there's no title company in, you know, such and such a country. 
but this guy owns this land and his family's owned it forever. And like, that's a great way to use that technology to go, yeah, this is my land. And now I can use the asset value of that to, to, you know, improve my financial being. The thing that always kind of strikes me as funny is I can take my American express card, right? Anywhere in the world. And I can literally swipe it or insert the chip or use my Apple pay on my phone. And like instantaneously, Amex does all this calculation to say, is this really OG? Is this something that he would buy? You know, are we going to approve this transaction? Like all that, like in a millisecond, right? But if I've got two bank accounts that are in the same city across the street from one another, it takes three business days for a check to clear, you know, or two days to get money from Chase to the credit union or whatever. And to me, that seems like that's where, from a personal experience anyway, I'd like to see some some movement on that. And I know there's other companies that are working on that sort of stuff, but the payment processing, I think, is important at the grand scale, right? Like between shipping companies, right? How do we transfer $6 million so we can ship our goods, you yeah. know, put them on the boat today? Yeah. Uh, and that's good for those people. But for me, just more practical use of this stuff would be like, how do I get money from one bank account to the other? Because I forgot to transfer money yesterday. And now the only solution I have is to go to the bank, make a cash withdrawal, drive to the other bank, make a cash deposit. You know, it just seems like I should be able to authenticate that and move it between banks pretty easily. What's interesting to this from, from my standpoint is the duplicity of the banking system. While you're watching banks on one hand tell you, this is not the future, it's a joke. You're seeing people, CEOs of these companies. And on the other hand, you're seeing them start to heavily invest in this stuff. It's almost like you saw utility companies saying, yeah, solar, these alternative energies, putting this on your house, not a great deal, not a great investment. And at the same time, they're out building huge solar fields of their own, right? <laughs> so they can sell it to you while at the same time, they're busy doing it, that they're busy uh, telling you that it's that it's not a great deal. I think, um, I think clearly... I'm cynical about this as an investment, not that it's not the future, because this whole discussion we're talking about is how I think it yeah. can can be the future. But if you're trying to invest in this future, to this ripple dude's point, yeah, who our, knows? Our, our blockchain and our and our cryptocurrency are two different things. Yeah, it's going to be still a long road there, which I think is our first lesson. And our second lesson is you want 7% guaranteed? I'd love to get 7% guaranteed. Not sure that this is the right way to do it. I hope they can, but... Um, Prove me wrong. Yes. Upstairs talking to mom right now is uh, Stephanie McCullough. She founded Sophia Financial back in 2011, which means she's been a financial planner OG for 21 years. Her goal was to... I think you want to do the math on that again. Well, I did forget one important data point. She'd already been in the business for 14 years. How about that? Ah, gotcha. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I might as well say that with my outside voice instead of my inside, <laughs> inside my head voice. Uh, she was hoping to help women address areas of money stress and free up their time and mental energy to spend on things that are truly important, something we talk about a lot here on Stacking Benjamins. Before she was in financial services, get this, man, she worked with the Department of Commerce in Washington, D.C., teaching people more than twice her age how to confidently handle a sailboat at the Annapolis Sailing School and organizing uh, stimulating educational events for high school students at the World Affairs Council of Philadelphia. She's done it all. She earned her master's in international economics from the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies and has her bachelor's from Duke University. We're happy to have this uh, blue devil coming down to the basement right now. Let's say hi to Stephanie McCullough. Stephanie, how are you? I'm doing well, Joe. How are you doing? Well, I'm fantastic. How, you've been a financial planner for how long? 20 years. How did you get started in this business? Oh, gosh, it's an interesting story. And I always have to like control myself and not go on and on too long. <laughs> um, it was a career change for me. My husband and I were living in Washington, D.C., thinking about maybe having some children. And if we had children, wouldn't it be nice to be near the grandparents who were all outside of Philadelphia? The next day, my husband got a job offer in Philadelphia. So we're like, oh, 
the universe wants us to move back to Philly. I guess so. What the heck am I going to do? I grew up with my father as a financial advisor, and I grew up never wanting to do what he did. <laughs> <laughs> like adamantly, I don't want to do that. But I'd been out in the real world a few years, and I'm like, oh, kind of this money stuff, this financial planning, investment advising, insurance stuff. I see how it's valuable. Maybe I can make a pitch to dad that I could join his company. And I put together this whole, you know, proposal of what I would do. And I think, you know, it was like, you had me at hello, right? Dad was like, one of my kids is interested in the business. Yay! And that's all I needed to say. So that was my start 20 years ago. But a lot of people, as you know, feel like you do, Stephanie. They know that money's important. A lot of people listen to this show. Tell us. They know money's important. They know that they should pay attention to it. And yet they really don't want a lot to do with it. So they go out looking for a good financial planner. And often, as you know, you and I have heard the horror stories. We just had our friend Lorraine L. on talking about some horror stories, people looking for advisors. They end up finding the wrong person. What do you think the biggest first step is for somebody looking for a financial planner? What should they do first? Oh, you know, I have heard some of these stories, like literally just in the past week, some nightmare stories. One woman who's now a client of mine went through four advisors, none of whom was right for her. So she'd kind of given up on the whole industry. And then I'm friends with her sister-in-law and she read my website. She's like, oh my gosh, she, she keeps telling me I missed some classes in financial advisor school because I'm not belittling her or, you know, <laughs> telling her what to do with her money. Cracks me up. So yes, I agree. And I think part of the problem is, is that there's these different titles that financial advisors call themselves and there's no regulation around what an advisor can call themselves, right? They can call themselves an investment advisor, a wealth manager, a financial planner, financial advisor. And to the public that those might mean different things, but in reality, they're kind of all interchangeable. They don't necessarily indicate much of anything. So back to your question, what's a good first step? Yeah. I think you got to do a little self-reflection and figure out what do you want help with? What are you hoping that a professional can do for you? And that's the first question I always ask someone who comes to me. What, do you, what are you looking for someone to do for you? But don't you find sometimes that what, the, what your client wants and what they really need are two totally different things? Well, yes, that's a good point. <laughs> but, you know, if, for example, I'm talking to a woman tomorrow who just had some debts in her family and she has inherited some money, she needs someone to help her figure out how to invest this money and put it to work for her life, right? So that's kind of what I mean with what do you need someone to help you with? Yeah. Or are you trying to figure out budgeting and how to pay off your student loans? Like that's your that's your pain point. So getting clear on on what your main question is, I think is the first step. So you get clear about what you want. Where do you turn? I mean, nobody uses yellow pages anymore, right? <laughs> there's there's no you can't just look in the phone book. Who's the person that does that thing? Or if you do, you still might find the wrong person. Yeah, no, totally true. Asking people you know doesn't always get you the right person either, right? Because the person that your cousin uses or the person your next door neighbor loves might be doing a different set of functions for them or might have a different approach than what fits for you. So it it definitely is a challenge. There are organizations that list their members. There are certainly online listings. But I think what you have to do is is talk to a bunch of people and get a feel for the range of what's available. It sounds like you also have to try to, without prying, dig into actually what they do for them, right? Because to, because to your point, if it's your cousin, if it's your cousin doing something, you know, um, th they might be providing, to your point, a whole different service. Yeah, completely. Maybe your cousin's puzzle was, you know, gosh, I really need life insurance because I just had a baby. But your puzzle is dealing with your student debt. Those are two different areas of expertise. And one advisor might have both of those or might not. Are there any places where you like to go look then? I, I find out about somebody and I want to start digging up some dirt. What type of investigation do you go through to find out if this person might be a fit before you talk to him? Or do you talk to him first? Well, I think it's worth, you know, doing some some homework. There's something called broker check. So if the advisor is registered with FINRA, the financial institute, whatever they're called, the regulatory body, you can go on broker check and see if they have black marks on their record. But not every advisor is, is licensed that way. So that doesn't get you the whole story. Is that a red flag if somebody's not licensed that way? No, for sure not. Okay. Because advisors can get paid different ways. They can either earn commissions from selling a product, in which case you have to have securities licenses and be registered with FINRA, or, or both, 
you can get, say, an advisory fee for either planning or for investment advice. And then you don't have to be registered that way. You're registered a different way. So yeah, it's terribly confusing. Is there a place it is? <laughs> that, that's the part that sucks. So I check broker check. I love that. What do I do then? I think doing a little bit of your creeping is not a bad idea, right? Check out the website if there's a website. I mean, part of the problem is that 90% of financial advisors' websites all say the same thing. <laughs> yeah, they do. It's, it's, it's like a mechanic that says they're ASC certified. Like it says nothing. Like, of course, my mechanic's ASC certified. Yeah, exactly. So that doesn't always tell you too much. Who they work for is, is one piece of the puzzle, right? Financial advisors can work for a bank or a credit union or a big you know, Wall Street firm, the names we've all heard, or they can work for an insurance company. They can work for a local, small, independent company. So if you're seeing a big brand name on the card, maybe that tells you a little bit. If you're seeing a local, small, independent name Again, none of these are bad or good on their own. They're just more pieces of information. Gotcha. So then I go in and I meet with somebody. Any clues that I can get when I'm sitting in an advisor's waiting room or uh, from the receptionist maybe about whether they're going to be right for me or not? Oh, I think so, for sure. I mean, it all goes back to how people get paid, right? And that's one of those things that the general public has to not be afraid of asking. Ask how people get paid. But you can get some clues, right? Because a lot of advisors are paid based on the stuff they sell you or the investments you have with them, they have minimums, meaning if you don't have half a million dollars to invest with that advisor, they are they can't help you. They won't help you. So I think, you know, the layout of an office and the look and the decor of an office can give you some kind of hints, right? Is it putting off an air of great wealth and kind of exclusivity or is it an approachable, friendly place where you want to be? And obviously I'm making judgment right with, right. with just how I describe those, <laughs> right. but it gives you a feel for what you're looking for and whether you feel comfortable. It's funny. The thing that always drove me crazy when I walk into some advisor's offices is having CNBC on and the stock ticker going and uh, immediately, I don't know, for me, and this is judgment also, th th it was a turnoff. I'm like, really? V your financial planner is a place for you to calm down, to think holistically, to think about what you can control. And we're going to start off this. I mean, imagine me being a financial planner and my clients watching the world collapse in 2002 or in, you know, <laughs> 2007, you know, watching one of these things. I, did, I don't, I don't know if I see CNBC on or a bunch of uh, industry rags out that are, I, that's a turnoff for me. No, I'm totally with you. I mean, one of the things that I believe in is, you know, long-term investing and, you know, not trying to time the market or, or place bets on sectors or industries. But if someone's watching CNBC all day, that's a different message. You know, I've had people try to pitch me on services for advisors, have CNBC in your office. I'm like, no, that's exactly what I don't want. <laughs> I want the travel channel on. Yeah, right. The fun stuff. <laughs> Absolutely. The good stuff. The uh, health channel. I don't know. I also, now that I think about this, going into different offices, if the um, if the receptionist seems disenfranchised, that's a clue as to your advisor's actual personality, I think. If the, if the people that work with them aren't that happy you might not end up that happy. It just always seemed to me that the crappy advisor, Stephanie, had receptionists that couldn't stand being there. And there was always a that's so funny. direct correlation. Yeah. Yeah. That's like an early, early warning signal, right? The canary in the coal mine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But anyway, so we got a few of those, but you end up meeting the advisor. How do you think that meeting should go? It's perfectly legitimate for you to have a lot of questions for that advisor and you should. But at the same time, that quest, that advisor should have a lot of questions for you. There shouldn't be kind of cookie cutter advice, right? One size fits all. You want somebody who's really listening to your situation, your needs. No two people's situations are the same. So in order for the advisor to give you advice, they're going to have to know a lot of things about you. And I don't think you have to get completely financially naked in that first meeting, but you want to get a sense as to whether this advisor cares about you as a human being, whether they're really interested in what's going on for you and whether you feel like you can trust this person to really relay all the details. I mean, I always sort of tell people, I can't tell you what to do with your money until I know what your money is for, right? Money is just a tool. Everybody's situation is different. Should you be prepared to give them details? I don't think you have to do that in the first meeting. Like when you mean details of, of your 
Yeah, you know, like what's uh, in your 401k and Yeah, how much how money have my 4 Yeah, exactly. I don't think so. Personally, I mean there there are advisors who will send you a big old, you know, fact-finding sheet, many many pages that you have to fill out before you even sit down with them. And that's part of a lot of advisors process, but to me, you shouldn't have to reveal that stuff until you're comfortable knowing that this is the person you want to work with. That's for you what the first meeting's all about is are we comfortable? Are we a fit? Yeah, for sure. Okay. For sure. So to get comfortable, what type of things am I looking for then, Stephanie? I'm almost thinking of more like, you know, bad stories. I met a woman recently who had had a serious auto accident and had a big settlement that she needed help investing. And she said she went to 10 different advisors. Sadly, she this all happened before she met me. But she went to 10 advisors and seven of them like had a, a PowerPoint presentation. They walked through slide by slide. And when she had a question, they're like, no, no, we're not on that slide yet. Right. So like if they're giving you a standard canned pitch, bleh, that's really not an indication that they're going to customize what they're doing for you. Do you like somebody who's kind of I guess Gordon Ramsay's the right word. People know who that guy is, where they're very blunt. And I'm talking about Gordon Ramsay at the end of his show, not at the beginning where he's just kind of a jerk, but at the end where he's like he's very blunt, but he's clearly on your team. You know what I mean? He's telling you, hey, Stephanie, okay. you're screwing this stuff up. I can't believe it. I want you to be successful, but you're messing this up. Or maybe Simon Cowell, right. you know, are you looking right, for right. that? Or is that even an individual thing? Tough love. I say that that's an individual thing, right? Personality. You, you're you looking for support in some way and you know yourself and what's going to work for you. So I think you have to find someone that that is going to get you where you're trying to go, right? In the end, this is a business transaction. You're trying to get some value out of it. So if you need, you know, a very soft touch and an empathetic person who's, you know, going to totally understand your situation and help give you little nudges to get there, that's what you're looking for. If you need that tough love and that, you know, hard line accountability, then that's what you're looking for. And there are people who really just want to outsource the whole thing and be like, you know, tell me what to do take my money and invest it for me. I don't want to have to worry about it. That's legitimate. And then you want to find someone who works that way. You talked earlier about fees. Obviously, people are going to have questions about fees. We hear all the time that we should ask advisors about fees. I mean, when I read the press, they always say, well, it depends on how the advisor's paid and only pay an advisor this way. Nobody really explains, though, why fees are so important. Like, why is it so important how your advisor gets paid? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's totally crucial. You know, I work with women and I'm always telling them it's not a rude question you can ask how someone gets paid. Like in our day-to-day -day lives, we don't talk to our neighbors and our friends about what they get paid and how they get paid. Maybe we have a couple people we share that stuff with, but so it feels like a rude question. But in this situation, it's definitely not because there are all these different ways that it could work. And again, I don't think there's any, you know, one structure that's right and one structure that's wrong. There are good and maybe not so great advisors in every different structure. I'm not, I'm trying not to say bad. Um, <laughs> So, you know, so it's important to know how people get paid because you're in the end paying that fee some way or other. So the two kind of basic types that come to mind are getting paid. So the advisor could get paid by a financial services company as a commission for selling a product. So that's kind of more the, I don't want to say old fashioned way, but. But it actually is. I mean, I think that term's yeah. fine because it really is. You see fewer and fewer people paid that way. Well, right. And it is originally the only way that advisors got paid, right. right? But today, like if you want to go buy disability insurance from someone, they're going to get a commission, right? So I don't think it's evil. So I'm not I'm not one of these, you know, fee only people, meaning that like everyone that's fee only is good and everyone who's not is evil. Right. But the other way is, you know, you are directly paying the advisor. And that could be on what we call an assets under management basis, meaning if you're investing $100,000 with that person and they're charging you 1%, you're going to pay them $1,000 over the course of the year, usually from your account. Or it could be for a planning. It could be on an hourly basis for planning. It could be on a retainer basis just for the financial planning stuff, whether or not there are assets to invest. So I think it's important to know how someone gets paid because, number one, you're going to know kind of, you know, what the range of things they can do for you is and maybe how valuable a client you are to them. You know, if it's all about assets under management and you have a small pot of assets, you want to think about whether you're going to get the treatment of their A clients. The other piece of it is, is knowing how they're incented, right? If they're only compensated on selling products, you know, if your only tool is a hammer, does everything look like a nail, right? If they only get paid by selling you life insurance, then 
are they going to sell you way too much life insurance? Yeah, it, 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 it speaks to motivation. And to your point, I've yes. known people that are commission-only advisors that I would send mom to. But, Absolutely. And I know people that are fee-only advisors, which is like the, the hot way right now, it seems like, in the press, and they're morons. <laughs> so. Absolutely. So right, you, right? Bernie Madoff was a fee-only advisor. Right. Good point. Great point. Finally, anything that we that we missed that we should ask advisors? What are some weird questions that you've gotten that people maybe should ask their advisor that you don't hear often enough? Well, I think one, and I've had this issue with my clients. Right, we're a good fit. We like each other. We, you know, we're gonna we're gonna do good stuff together. But we haven't talked about how the money is going to get invested yet. You know, very often. Clients are not stupid. They're not babes in the woods, right? They're they're reading articles. They're they're aware of different types of investment philosophies. They might come in with a certain viewpoint. They want low cost. They want ETFs only. You got to ask your advisor or this person you're you're interviewing to possibly be your advisor. What's their investment philosophy? What's their investment process? How do they view the investment world? And then the other piece of it is how involved are you going to be as the client? You know, there, there's a whole range of that. I had a client who's no longer a client because it wasn't a great fit for me, but she wanted to sit down with me and pick stocks because that's what she did with her old advisor. And that's fine, but that's not what I do. So in the end, you know, we were still friends, but we parted ways because that just wasn't a fit. So having that conversation with, with your advisor, with your potential advisor, I think is important. I love that idea. And just just to open up the conversation, right? What's your investment policy? And if your advisor kind of, your potential advisor kind of stumbles on that question, Houston, we might have a problem. <laughs> That's true, for sure. Your advisor probably should and have think, some, yeah. I think another thing to ask is about technology, right? More and more advisors are using some pretty cool technology to enhance the client service experience. So kind of asking, what does your client experience look like? Right? Is it going to be a lot of paper forms we're filling out and everything's going to be paper back and forth? Are there online stuff? You know, are my statements going to come in the mail? Do I have an online portal? All that kind of stuff I think is important to find out too up front. About how many meetings do you think are right for somebody to meet with a financial advisor, let's say per year? Yeah. You know, and again, this is an it depends. I try to see my clients twice a year, but I have clients that's like pulling teeth. They're like, no, I'm happy. It's all good. I'm like, no, I'd really like to sit down and chat with you. Other people want to see a face-to-face -face four times a year. And then, you know, there are people who need more, well, I don't want to say reassurance, but they need more um, ongoing information or they, they have questions about their financial life and they want to talk up front. So getting clear with the advisor on kind of what their model is and if it's okay for you to be calling more often is also a good piece of it. I want to go back to that person that doesn't want to meet. They love you, but everything's fine. They don't want to meet. Why do you want to still meet? Well, it's important for me to know if anything big in their life has changed, right? Have they been laid off? Did they have three more children? Back to, I can't tell you what to do with your money until I know what it's for. Your money is for your life in some way or other, for something you're trying to accomplish. So if, if there's been changes in that, we might need to adjust what's going on with the money. That's another thing that when I was a financial planner back in the day, it always frustrated me when somebody would have those big moments come and they wouldn't call me. And then we'd get together to your point <laughs> and I'd say, y you made this huge decision, all these huge decisions. And I, th I thought you hired me to give you some input on that stuff. And they go, oh, I didn't know I could call you. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. But I guess that's a question for your advisor too. Is there, are there extra fees for additional calls? You know, how often can I call you? What should I call you? Should I not call you? Like, I think that's probably important too. Yeah, for sure. And then, you know, is there a team of people that I'm going to be interacting with? I mean, I've heard stories that, you know, you see the big advisor once and then you kind of get the associates or the, you know, the interns or the, the part-time folks right. from then on. And it's hard to see the big guy ever again. Yeah. Or a guy like Rick Edelman, who's on the radio, has a huge firm. And if you go to Edelman and Associates, your chance of ever seeing Rick there is zero, right? I mean, but Rick's job right. is to bring clients in for other advisors to service. And once again, nothing wrong with that. Right. But yeah, who, who am I going to work with? Great question. Just knowing it up front. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you just service people then in the, in the Philadelphia area or everywhere? I do not. I have clients all over the country. I have clients I've never met face to face. Awesome. And you use then technology, speaking about technology. Uh, how does that work? Yeah. You know, I mean, again, it, it has to be what the client's comfortable with, but I definitely use Zoom for video conferences and for sharing of screens. 
you know, we've got ways to to send documents digitally. We can we can share things securely in the cloud. So there's definitely ways to work together very closely without being in the same room. I love seeing uh, how things are changing. Uh, we'll link to your practice in our show notes at stackybenjamins.com. But tell everybody about your practice, Sophia Financial. By the way, and thank you for coming on and talking about this because this is this is something people don't get to see what somebody like you does every day. And uh, seeing it from the advisor side, I think, is so important. But But tell everybody a little bit about Sophia Financial. Yeah. So I mentioned I started 20 years ago. And for a while, I was working on the retirement plan of a hospital. And in a hospital, as you may know, like 85% of the employees are women. So I would meet one-on-one with the employees and so many of the women were stressed out and overwhelmed or had outsourced the investment or financial planning function to a man in their lives who may or may not be doing a good job of it. And then they had some nightmare stories about being mistreated by the industry. So I had this idea percolating for a while and then the hospital had some changes going on and they let us go. And I'm like, oh, I get to do this thing now. So I started my own practice about eight years ago, working with professional women, mostly age 40 and up, who are stressed out about being on their own, making financial decisions, worried about having enough to retire, or even just, you know, really what all my clients say to say to me is, I just want to make sure I'm being smart about it. So it's about empowering women to make wise financial decisions. And I purposely don't have investment minimums. I can work with someone for 90 minutes for a flat fee. I can do a full-on plan. I can do a retainer. Or, of course, I can help with investments or insurance as well. Awesome. And uh, the website, if people want more, is? Sophia Financial. That's S-O-F-I-A Financial.com. And if you're walking the dog or out on your morning run or commute wherever, we'll have our link on our show notes page at stackybenjamins.com. By the way, I like your Facebook videos, too. You've got Thank some, you. You've got some great Facebook videos. And that's just Sophia Financial to, to follow you on Facebook? Yes. Or Stephanie McCullough. Both, awesome. Both pages. And you know, we'll have those. Richie will have those in our show notes also. Stephanie, thanks for hanging out with us for a few minutes. Yeah, it was great to visit the basement. I've wanted to for a long time. Thanks for I'm having so me. I'm so glad you could do it. Hey there, trivia fans, and welcome to National Weed Pulling Day. Joe's mom asked us all to celebrate this momentous holiday by weeding her garden. But I just realized I don't want Joe and OG pulling weeds. My friend Gertrude down at the Sizzler told me that in Colorado, Washington, Oregon, and California, I can make huge money selling weeds. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm pulling them all, filling up the back of the El Camino, and it's money-making side gig road trip time, baby! (laughs) I've already done some market analysis, and I thought I could use it for today's trivia. How about this question? Which age group is the most rapidly growing consumers of weed? I'll have your answer right after I find a tarp to make sure these dandelions don't blow away while I'm cruising towards my money. We're so happy that Stacky Benjamins has been aligned with Magnify Money for a number of years You know, everybody, OG, comparison shops, everything, like which seats are most expensive on an airplane, maybe how to travel and put your kids in places way far away from you. People are trying. They comparison (laughs) shop that stuff all the time. They do. And yet, what's the point? And I'm actually referring to a piece in our uh, basement Facebook group. Stegabedjamins.com forward slash basement will give you the link to get there. But I like Rocky's reply. I would separate my kids, put them in seats all around the plane, and yell to people next to them how bad their kids are. That's so good. But people comparison shop that stuff all the time. And instead, why don't they comparison shop the things that they use every day to manage their money? And that's what you do at Magnify Money. StackyBenjamins.com forward slash Magnify Money is the link. And here's what I did when I used Magnify Money with my kids, OG. They didn't have any credit at all. We went immediately to a blog post that you can click to right from our link. And you see on that blog post all the ways to begin to build credit. So my kids applied for secured credit cards, which was a great way for me to get off the hook. I didn't want to co-sign. I've seen too many people get in trouble co-signing with their kids. And maybe you co-signed with your kids. That's fine. I Instead, they went for secured credit cards. Now those securities are off. We paired them with debitize. And you know what? Now both of my kids went back to Magnify Money recently at 23 years old and they have the top reward point cards and zero balances on their cards because we talked about credit early and we used a great site like Magnify Money. So whether it's credit card debt, student loan debt, 
you need a ride to work and you have to have an auto loan, don't want an auto loan, but you got to have one, stackybedjamins.com forward slash magnified money is the place to go. We're also happy today to have just a minute to talk about the stacker. I don't know if you know this OG, but we're stumbling out of the basement and taking the show on the road. Is that crazy or what? I've been told that we're going on a field trip. I've not. <laughs> I can't wait. It's going to be one of those big yellow buses. Stop kicking my seat. <laughs> the hazy. This reminds me of Billy Madison, where we have to ride around and we've got the crazy bus driver. <laughs> The best, the best way to find out about stuff like our tour, which is coming to Orlando, Kansas City, and Detroit, is to subscribe to The Stacker. It's our newsletter comes out nearly once a week. You can get it by going to stackybedjamins.com forward slash stacker. Not only do we have that, each week we do a Facebook Live on Thursday at noon. Well, once again, that's most weeks. That's when we're here in the basement. But to find out who our guest is going to be, what the topic's going to be, if there's anything relevant that we're actually talking about that particular day, head to stackybenjamins.com Stacky forward slash stacker for more on the tour, for more on what's coming up in the basement, and for great ideas about money. Always free. You can always unsubscribe whenever you want, but mom puts hers on the fridge. Just saying. Hey, money fans, I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I've been thinking about how I'm going to roll in the dough with this weed selling business. I'm probably a little like Elon Musk. I'm so far ahead of my time because people just give me this weird look when I tell them what I'm going to do. But you and I both know they're all begging old Doug for a piece of this action when I score a bunch of money off these weeds. I've got not just dandelion, but I got crabgrass, I got your chickweed, I got your white clover, got your common nettle, I got the piece de resistance, prickly lettuce. Oh, that stuff is choice. I'm going to make a fortune. And to go along with my market analysis, here's the answer to today's trivia question. Which age group is the most rapidly growing consumer segment for weed? The answer? According to data gathered by the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, the fastest growing segment of weed users is people age 65 and up. Oh, listen to this. Weed use among seniors grew 250% between 2006 and 2013. I never knew anybody used weeds, but heck, where there's a buyer, I will fill that need in the marketplace. I'm off to start pulling. See ya. Big thanks to Stephanie for coming down to the basement. OG, are you sometimes surprised by how few questions people ask you about you and how they're going to interface with you before they make their decision, yes or no? I chalk it up to a lot of research beforehand. I'm in a unique position in that a lot of our clients come from the show, right? So some people have listened to the show a really long time, so they kind of already know all that kind of ins and outs about who I am and how I think about things and family and kind of all those important background things that you use to kind of develop your viewpoint on that person's character. But we also have a pretty well laid out process and system that we go through in our, on our first calls. So I think it's pretty transparent, but, uh, but I do get occasionally some questions on who really am I going to talk to and that sort of thing. Yeah. To Stephanie's point, you definitely want to, uh, want to make sure that you're very clear about how the relationship's going to go ahead of time. Hey, uh, not to change the subject, but why don't we throw out the Haven Lifeline, OG, and tackle some of life's, or rather life insurance's most important questions. You know, our friends over at Haven Life Insurance Agency, they're disrupting the life insurance industry, which my point of view here needs to be disrupted, and I'm so happy to see them doing it. By focusing on those two things that you value most. 7% yields. <laughs> Deliciousness of 7% yields. <laughs> Explosive growth of my Ripple account. How about uh, your family and your time? Really, the two most important things in your life. Although I think that's probably close three and four, to your point. It's why they created a simple way for you to buy affordable and dependable term life insurance online. Head to stackybedjamins.com forward slash Haven Life now for a free estimate for coverage and to learn about life insurance the modern way. And man, if you've ever had to buy life insurance before 
and then you go to Haven Life, you're going to see the big difference and the modern way. Let's uh, throw out the Haven Lifeline today to our friend, good friend Lee. Say hi, Lee. Hey, Joe and OG. Hello, Doug. Hey, it's Lee from Bald Thoughts, your favorite travel hacker. I just left my job and have a retirement plan question. Uh, I had a 401k and now plan to work for myself with no employees going forward. So what options do I have and and does the 401k contributions I've made affect how much I can put into the plan going forward? Then also, I know you can't contribute to a traditional IRA if you have a plan at work, but how does that work for this year and how does that work going forward since I'll have my own retirement plan for my own business? So thanks for taking my question. By the way, I've listened to every episode of the Second Benjamins and all the reiterations before and I can verify that nobody has ever learned anything from your show. Have a good one. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks for the question, Lee. By the way, congratulations to Lee for leaving his job and going full-time at Bald Thoughts. We're going to have Lee on to talk about when you're Lee's age and you're, you've young kids at home, like how do you make that decision? And uh, so you're going to hear more from Lee in the upcoming months. But let's help out Lee, man. What do you think? So two things for Lee – and for anybody else that's kind of going the self-employment route, really there's ostensibly two plans that you should be considering. There's other versions of this, but but really the primary ones are SEP IRA, which is very simple. It's just the calculation is 25% of your net, calculate it at the end of the year, put it in, tax guy helps you figure it out. Maximum is 54000 so you've got a lot of wiggle room to put a lot of money away if that's what you want to do relative to a 401k. Or you could do an individual 401k or solo plan, right? Solo K is sometimes what they call them. Work very similarly to a regular 401k plan, only you're the record keeper. So you have to keep track of your contributions. So you contribute the 18.5 and you can give yourself a match. And the match works very similarly to the uh, SEP. So you can do about 25% of your net as a match, again, up to 54,000. So there's pros and cons of each one of these things. One of the pros of the individual 401k plan is that you now have the access to do loans from it. I know everybody's it's going to, oh my gosh, the hate mail, Joe, that you're going to get is out of this <laughs> world, but it's there, right? It's worth noting that that's a, that's a thing that you can do. Whereas in the SEP, you're, you know, you're not going to be able to do that. It's just be a normal distribution. So as much as you shouldn't take money out of your 401k ever, 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 never, 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 it's a distinct difference. I think that from a contribution max standpoint, um, you'll probably be able to contribute more into the solo plan than the SEP until you make like 200 and some odd grand a year net, then you max out that 25% anyway, right? So like if you're going to try to say, well... How much can I put in, you know, how do I max that out? Um, probably in the solo 401k, you're going to be able to do a little bit more, but also requires a little bit more, a little more paperwork and that sort of thing. You have to keep track of that on your own. But um, I kind of like the solo plan. It gives you more flexibility, gives you more contribution amounts generally early, plus the option to do the loan if that ever came up in a million years, which it would never, I must say. But everything else is about the same. As far as traditional IRA plans, yeah, you can't do a traditional IRA this year because you had access to a 401k plan earlier this year. So, you know, you can do a non-deductible one, but that's a whole different topic. And then in the future, you're not going to be eligible to do one either because presumably you'll have the, the SEP or the solo plan. Thanks for the question, Lee. We have another question here. We also get mail down in the basement. And today's question comes to us from Blair. Blair has a similar question, OG. I'm leaving my current employer at the end of this month to start a new job. Currently, I have a simple IRA with TD Ameritrade and will ultimately roll that into my new 401k when I'm eligible to start with my new company in less than a year, which also fortunately puts me beyond the two-year period for which you basically can't do anything with your simple IRA. In the meantime, can I still contribute to my simple IRA account? Is this advisable or do I focus more on my investment account, M1 Finance, by the way? Thank you for that recommendation for the next year. Thanks. By the way, if you're going to use M1 Finance, stackybenjamins.com forward slash M, the number one finance. Uh, Gets you there and that uh, tells them that we sent you. But anyway, first of all, I kind of challenge the assumption. I don't know that Blair should roll that into the new 401k. Yeah, I'm with you. I don't know that I would want to 
automatically roll that over into my new 401k plan. There's some reasons you'd want to and some reasons you might not want to. Chief among them are investment choices and cost structure. So you might be able to have just have it in a traditional IRA at TD and um, be able to pick whatever you want. Try to try to keep the uh, flexibility. No, you can't contribute to the simple in the meantime. Once you're separated from service from that employer, it's tied to that employer, then you're done. No more contributions can go into it. If you're not eligible for the 401k for a little while in your new job, best bet is just to set that money aside. What I strongly would recommend, especially if you get toward the end of, you know, let's say that it takes a year, you're going to start July 1st and, and you're not eligible for 12 months, right? What you want to do then is set aside the next year's worth of contributions so that starting July next year, you can max out your 401k just with the remaining six months of the year. Now that's going to affect your cash flow, you know, because you have to put $2,000 a month in your 401k. But since you set that money aside for the last year, you can do that. So Live you kind of can play instead. a little bit of a catch up yeah. game. You're still going to miss a year, you know, or whatever of contributions, but at least you don't miss two years, right? So put that in your you know, brokerage account at M1 or, or uh, wherever else you want to do, Roth IRA. Great idea. And thank you for the question, Blair. If you've got a question for the show, head to stackybedjamins.com. And at the top of the page, you'll see the questions tab. Click on that. It'll tell you all the ways that you can interface with the show. Thanks to everybody who was on the show. Actually, from here, we'll see you guys all next time. Go stack some Benjamins. Doug, what should we have learned today, man? So what did we learn today? First, Thinking about hiring a financial planner? Take advice from Stephanie McCullough. Don't just ask questions to make sure you find the right person for your team, but also do a little detective work online and in the reception area. That may help you avoid getting into the wrong relationship. Second, a steady 7% income stream? Maybe it's the next best thing, but we'll pass. Generally, if someone's offering something nobody else can do in the market, buyer beware. But the big lesson, don't tell everyone you know about your weeds pulling business. Apparently, Sergeant Simpson at the Texarkana Police Department is on his way over right now. See what I mean? Everybody wants a piece of this here action. Special thanks to financial planner Stephanie McCullough for joining us today. You'll find a link to her firm, Sophia Financial, on our show notes at stackingbenjamins.com. This show was created by Joe Saul Cihai, produced by Richie Rutter Reese, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Online, visit us on Twitter at, at @sbenjaminscast or on our Facebook page. Shannon Cowan is our community manager and social media guru. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I really thought doing these credits completely naked would have been a lot more fun than it actually was. SB Podcast may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remuneration. There's no way you would take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only, and before making any financial moves, consult with a real financial advisor. Special thanks to Sergeant Simpson at the Texarkana Police Department for explaining this whole weeds versus weed thing. Apparently, one letter changes the game a great deal. Who knew? Very short after show today because you and I have places we had to be. I had to be somewhere in exactly two and a half minutes. So this is going so to be. This will, this will be really short or I'll just drag it out for like seven minutes and. That'd be perfect. Everybody will just wonder where you went. That's great. Uh, TV shows. 
I have to tell you, I just finished episode, excuse me, season one of uh, The Last Kingdom. And man, this show, and I know I talked about this before, about this being about uh, the time of the Vikings going into into England. Just great historical drama. Like I love season one. Can't wait to get into season two. It's a little bloody. So if you're not into the bloody stuff, but I, but I love the historical aspect of it, like how the king, Alfred, was the real king that was there at the time, talking about the battle tactics. Like they really spent a long time, not like a historian, but really people in the drama, like saying, how are we going to do this? As an example, one scene, the English have the high ground on the Vikings, and they know the Vikings are going to have to come up the hill until the Vikings realize there's no water and no food up there, so we're just going to wait until the English come down the hill because they don't have enough supplies. So we're just going to stand here at the bottom of the hill and we're going to wait. And so then the English had to come up with something else, and that was neat. And then looking at Viking battle tactics, what they did with their, uh, with their shields and things, and just the psyche of the different, different warriors, I, I thought it was a fascinating series. Can't wait to get into season number two. Contrast that with, I just started watching the new season of Arrested Development, it's been so long since I've watched Arrested Development, and there's so many inside jokes, and they spend so much time explaining like where we're at in the joke and why this is funny, that we, we've we watched three episodes of this thing. I used to love Arrested Development. I can't get back into it. I'm like, it's just, it just they spend so much time explaining why this is funny. So season five of Arrested Development, big thumbs down for me. How about you? <laughs> In in the final eight seconds that we've got, yeah, that's right. Still on billions, uh, getting to start season six of Homeland, which is wash, rinse, repeat. So I know what six and seven are going to look like. If you have not watched Billions, spend the ten bucks, get the app. Season three is done now, so you can binge watch thirty six episodes. It's the best show on television. The writing is just out of this world. Were you the one telling me about the Americans? Nope. Somebody was telling me about the Americans, and I read a thing, the Americans uh, finishing up its last season, about how brilliant that show is. And I'm very curious to maybe dig into that. I, I think that may be my next series. All right. Tell us what series you're watching. Maybe give us some suggestions as to what we should watch next. All right. I got to run. See you next time.